Speaking of uh, the family, it's inevitable that we're going to be mentioned as as he's always nicknamed the King of Horror, but Mr. Right. Mr. Stephen King. Now, I grew up reading Stephen King, and funny enough, uh, funnily enough, right, my first ever book that I read of Stephen King was not it, wasn't The Shining, wasn't Misery, it, it basically wasn't the favourites. Um, I, funny enough, I was I, I watched some of uh, Stephen King's adaptations of Misery and Shawshank Redemption, and I said, right, I gotta go uh, read the Stephen King book, and I went into this one shop and st standing right there, it said Stephen King, but it said the girl who loved Tom Gordon. Ah. And I just picked it. I was like, it's a Stephen King book and picked it up. I started reading it and I really enjoyed it. I, I don't know. I, I fell in love with the story. It wasn't a horror. It wasn't anything. I mean, it was just like a, a survival type of um, book. And I just immediately fell in love um, with the story then. And there was something about the girl. And I every time I tell people it was the girl who loved Tom Good and that was my first story, people go, what, what story is that? I've never heard of that story. And I'm thinking, you've never heard of that story? You've got to read it. <laughs> it's yeah, so it's amazing how, how even hardcore Stephen King fans sometimes don't know certain stories. You know, it's interesting. Because he's written so many. Yeah. And especially because... Uh, uh, I read the Eyes of the Dragon as well. I've I've tried reading books of his that are not well known, so I can get an understanding of right now. Let's go see what's the hype of Misery, It, Salem's Lot, Carrie. I read Carrie and I thought it was brilliant. And then it went from there, and all my drawers from underneath my bed were just filled with hardcover paperback Stephen King uh, books. And the one thing I regretted throwing out were the collection of uh, the Dark Tower series mm. i should have kept them because that would because now i've been looking up um because obviously the, we're talking about the multiverse now of stephen king's universe and he keeps connecting back to the dark tower i'm thinking uh i gotta read them i gotta read them <laughs> but um, you know i resisted reading dark tower the dark tower series for i mean decades um and it was essentially, uh, I'll be a name dropper, but it was partially, it was two people. It was Marsha um, Filippo, who was Steve's assistant. She was one person who kept after me. You need to read the Dark Tower books. And it was Frank Darabont, the guy who directed uh, Shawshank and, and Green Mile. And he kept telling me the same thing over and over again. And also Brian Freeman. Um, but, and, and it was strange because I'm a huge Stephen King fan and I'm a huge fan of Westerns. So you would think, I wouldn't have been so resistant, but I've never been a big fantasy guy. So, you know, I was hearing stuff about, you know, giant lobsters and talking trains and, and this and that and, and, and weird pronunciation of, you know, and I just, I, I it just put me off. Um, but I finally did read them all, the entire series back to back and, you know, thought it was wonderful. Um, but yeah, I've known Steve since, you know, uh, I mean, not personally, but, you know, I sent him issue number one of Cemetery Dance way back in 1988 um, and every issue after that. And very early on, you know, like year two, he was supportive of us. He gave us an advertising blurb, um, sent us chattery teeth to use uh, in issue 14 of the magazine, you know, a brand new story. And and and, a bus and, then, and then 10 years later, we published this for a limited edition of Pharma Buick 8 you know, our first book project. And then that, that led to other projects and he's appeared in a lot of my anthologies. So yeah, the, the first like 10 years was strictly a business relationship. And then like the next 10 years of friendship developed and, uh, and yeah, it just, you know, kind of progress like that. And, and, you know, he's a good friend. I, you know, text with him pretty much every day. And, uh, I, you know, he knows I, I wouldn't be doing this without him. Um, it was his work that, that, that kind of set me in the direction of, of wanting to do this for a living. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it is still often surreal to think that, you know, I used to walk around with a Stephen King paperback in my back pocket and, you know, tell my friends, you've got to read this book, you've got to see this movie. And then, you know, all these years later, I, I had a, the opportunity to, to write some books with them. That's just ridiculous still to think about. Where did, where did that professionalism of working with him turn into like a personal friendship then? When did you feel at what moment that you thought, um, that you said to yourself, me and Stephen King, even though we're going to be 
professionally working together so well, but when did you realize, oh my God, we're, I'm friends with Stephen King now? <laughs> well, before I, well, you know, it's interesting. The first time I met Steve was like 2001. So like, you know, what's that? 13 years after we started the business and, and, and I started sending him stuff up there. I, I, he had a, he had a 25th anniversary party of, uh, or actually 1999 it was. Um, he had a 25th anniversary party of the publication of Carrie in New York City. And, and he invited my wife and I, it was a big party, um, you know, great time. And, and we went up there, I, I met him briefly. Um, you know, there was probably a hundred people there. So um, didn't spend a lot of time with him. Um, and then uh, probably the next time I met him was, in Florida, we went to a baseball game together, spring training. And, and you know, at, at some point, it, it you know, we, we started texting and, and, and it was, had nothing to do with business. And it was some point in there where I realized, hey, you know, you know we're friends because um, we don't really text about business. We text about uh, our families and our dogs and movies and books and uh, sports, you know, baseball and football, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it is, I don't, I don't remember. I, I know this, he texted me first because I never would have, I, I would have never felt like, okay, I, you know, I've got Steve's number. I'm going to text him something out of the blue. So yeah, it wasn't that he, he texted me something. And then that kind of gave me the, the courage to text him back. And um, yeah, we, we have very similar sensibilities. And, and at some point it just spilled over from the business communication into, into personal. So, but it, yeah, it, 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 again, a surreal feeling to have and, uh, and, and something you feel very, you know, I feel very protective of. Mm. When it, when it came to, uh, I don't want to, I know um, you've probably been asked a lot about the, the, the Gwendy trilogy of how you and Stephen King work together on the, the, the Gwendy trilogy yeah. weeks and everything. But, um, what I want to know is the from a Buick 8 screenplay mm. and I want to know from a Buick 8 as a story is, as well um what if, if for some people who don't know the story um could you t elaborate on what the story's about and also how you and others come together to get a screenplay on the go because from what I read on re from researching there was a screenplay on the go for from a Buick 8. Yeah, I mean, from a Buick 8, it, it was meaningful to me for a bunch of different reasons. One, it was it was the first book, like I said, that we had the opportunity to publish. So I got to read it in manuscript well ahead of everyone else, um, you know, with the exception of his editor and his agent and that kind of thing. Um, you know, Buick 8 is, is, is set in Pennsylvania at a, at a state police barracks, and it's all about this young man, and I don't even remember his name anymore. I think it might be Charlie, but this, you know, this teenage boy whose father was a state trooper and he had been recently killed in a roadside accident. And he, he had always hung around the barracks and, and kind of, you know, did odd jobs. And, and it became especially important after his father's death, because essentially now the, the rest of the troopers kind of took him in and, and, and tried to, uh, you know, watch out for him. And, and the story of from a Buick eight is about this mysterious car that he discovers parked in one of the garages behind the barracks. And you find out that the, the troopers found this abandoned car, which may or may not actually be a car at a local gas station. And they towed it back to, and it was, you know, unoccupied. There was the, the gas station attendant talk, gave a description of the man, if he was a man who, who drove the car in and who disappeared um, and it's been back there for, for, for years. And, and what you find out is that these troopers have, have protected this, this car because it, it's a type of a portal and it might be even more than that. Um, but they, they recognize really early on that it's dangerous. Um, and they don't want to, they don't want to call in the government. It's, it's set. I don't remember what year it's set, but it's, it's not that long after like three mile Island, the nuclear ac accident there in Pennsylvania. So it, it's it's a book about secrets. It's a book about uh, not trusting, you know, the government, and it's a book about taking care of your own, um, which is which they do with the teenage boy, and uh, it's also probably most significantly, it's a book about how sometimes you have to accept things the way they are, 
um, because essentially the kid, his, his entire life's been turned upside down. And there's a great line where Sandy, and I do remember that his father's best friend, who, who is, who is one of the troopers tells the kid, you can't walk around shaking your fist at the sky every day. You know, you can't, you can't keep, you know, head butting against the unexplainable and trying to get understanding out of it. Sometimes you have to accept things and move on. That's part of life because the kid's really having a hard time accepting his father's death. Um, and for me, it was a life lesson thing. I mean, number one, it was a huge book for us, for my company. Um, but I, I'd lost my mother recently. You know, my mother had passed away. And I remember telling Steve actually on the beach in Florida at his house. And I remember saying, Steve, this book will always be really important to me because, you know, it helped me learn that lesson because there was a period of time where I kind of was shaking my fist to the sky saying, you know, why the hell did that have to happen like that? Um, and I kind of learned the lesson, you know, again, there's a, another great line that says there are Buicks everywhere. Sandy tells the kid. And, and what he's saying is, you know what, it, that's life, man. There are unexplainable incidents and moments everywhere in your life for everyone. And, and you have to accept them and move on. And, uh, and that book helped me learn that lesson. Um, so yeah, shortly after that, my, my screenwriting partner and I, who uh, I grew up with a guy named John Sheck and uh, in college, he ended up heading out to Los Angeles, became a big model. And then he became a big actor. He's been in movies with like Tom Hanks and Gwyneth Paltrow and Harvey Keitel and all these others. And, uh, and we ran into each other at some point, not, you know, maybe a year before that. And we said, you know, we got to start doing some things together. So we, he was married to Christina Applegate at the time. And uh, the first time I went out to LA was to shoot a short film called Heroes at, uh, at his and Christina's house. And uh, Christina was in it. We had Jaimin Hansu from Gladiator and, and Blood Diamond. He was in it. Um, and we did this little short film and uh, that kind of started us off. And then we started writing screenplays. We were able to uh, do a couple independent films. We did some rewrites for Sony. Um, we did uh, Masters of Horror season two together. We did uh, some Fear Itself for NBC. Um, and, uh, and we had a lot of success. Um, the two projects that are where our biggest projects never got made. And one was Buick A. It was our first full length screenplay. And Steve, I couldn't, you know, we were like scared to death to ask, but he, he gave us the okay. And we were close several times um, with a variety of different actors. And, but at the time, Stephen King and horror was not huge. And uh, we had a lot of people tell us, well, this is, this is awesome, but you know, this is, we, we, you know, we need more monsters. We need more scares. And we're like, this is one of those Stephen King stories that isn't all about the scares. It's more like Green Mile and Shawshank, where it's about humanity and, uh, and wonder. And, uh, but they weren't buying it at the time. So that was very frustrating. I mean, Steve was very generous and he let us hold on to that option for years. Um, and like I said, we came close, really close two or three times, but it never happened. So. That's my Buick Gates story. I still have regrets because I loved writing it. Yeah. i got to mention baseball because obviously you mentioned the baseball. So do you, did you two ever go to watch the, the Boston Red Sox, I take it? Because obviously he's a, he's a big Boston Red I'm Sox. A Baltimore, I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan. He's a Boston Red Sox fan. Um, we never – you know what? We haven't gone to Fenway yet. Um, but I, we've been to several games down in Florida, not far from where – the, the Baltimore Orioles uh, spring training um, facilities in, uh, I want to say Fort Myers, but I'm not sure that's right. Not far, it's Sarasota, not far from there. Um, isn't far from where Steve's uh, and Tabby's house is in Florida. So I've been down there, I think, three times to see games. And, you know, all three times with Steve and, and definitely enjoyable and uh, can talk a little you know, trash to each other about our favorite teams. And, uh, but yeah, I, I was, I grew up a big baseball fan and, uh, he, he's a huge baseball fan and, uh, as is his son, Owen. And, uh, um, yeah, so that's an enjoyable thing that we've been able to do. I, I do want to go to Fenway sometime though. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I, I met, I remember, um, I was going on a holiday to, I think, uh, I can't remember what country it was probably one of the, uh, the islands in somewhere. I think it was Grand Canaria. I can't remember, but I was going on holiday and I went into uh, WH Smith's uh, bookstore and I was looking around and I saw another Stephen King 
book up there. It was a novella and it was Blocky Billy. And I just thought, and I just thought, oh, I'll give that a read. And, and I'm reading it and I couldn't put it down. I, I think I finished it within a day. Oh, yeah, it's short. Yeah, yeah. so short. But it was, but for me, I mean, I, I am a, a reader, but I, the thing is with me is that it, I'm one of those ones that, takes his time I'll read a few pages and then I'll put it down and the following day I'll do it again and because if I try to keep reading it I'll either nothing to do with the story itself just for me I'll just go oh I'm gonna fall asleep here or I'm one of those people that got that's got to be in the right frame of mind to read it right. and obviously Stephen King being great writer that he is he was like right head down you're gonna read it <laughs> and so the, the reason yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to mention baseball because obviously I have heard that you you two got on baseball games. He's a big baseball fan. Wrote a book about baseball as well. Faithful, I would say. Uh, it- Faithful with Stuart O'Nan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Cemetery Dance actually published the first edition of uh, Block A Billy. It was kind of neat because we, we, you know, we kept that book a secret and didn't even announce it until opening day of whatever year that was. Um, but uh, his, his agent, Chuck Farrell, uh, sent us that story and said, Steve thought of you right away. Um, it was too long for the New Yorker. Um, so he wanted to see if you'd be interested. And I was absolutely interested. And I actually pitched the idea of doing it as a little book. And um, yeah, it uh, we kept it a secret from everyone. And like I said, we announced it on opening day and, and our phone rang, uh, my office phone rang off the hook that day from everyone from the New York Times to Sports Illustrated to everybody. And uh, ended up being this huge you know, hit. And then uh, his, his large publisher Scribner came in and said, you know, uh, do you mind if we take over it for, you know, from you? Because so many bookstores wanted copies and, and we were contracted to only do, I think 10,000 copies at first. And then they gave us an extension to do 20. And then we were going to do a co-publishing deal with Scribner and they just came in and bought us out. But yeah, our, our edition with the little baseball card, of uh of William Blakely of Blockade Billy uh you know uh shrink wrap to the book is still the world first edition and that was neat to, like I said we had a we had a huge secret that uh you know this new little Stephen King book that no one else knew about. <laughs>